Welcome, welcome. This is the Enlightenment Show, and I'm your host, Laurie Schoenfeld. Our guest today is the lovely Caitlin Hamilton Sumi, author of Geographies of the Heart. We're going to be talking all about her book today and the things that she treasures most within her life. Hello, Caitlin. Hello. Welcome. Thank you for having me. I've been so excited to speak with you. I've really been looking forward to it. And um, I just feel lucky to be here. So thanks for having me. Absolutely. We were just chatting before the show. It feels like we already know each other. So it's like a big kind of reunion. <laughs> yeah, it, does. it feels like we're just hanging out, having a coffee, catching up. And I have to remind myself, this is actually a show. <laughs> <laughs> it's not chat with Lori time, but it kind of is. That's what we decided. It kind of is time to chat. It's totally okay. Yeah. Yes. yes. Okay. <laughs> and we're both wearing red. It was not planned either. We just no. had the red vibe filled today. We did. Well, you said you thought of my cover, which I thought was very, very mm -hmm. kind because I hadn't thought, you know, I, this was not planned. And I thought, wow, that's really smart and kind both. So your book, I'm really excited to talk about it today as it is absolutely beautiful. And I sat with it after I read it and kind of just pondered and processed for a while and held your book to my heart. So thank you. Thank you. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. What, before we get started on the interview today, Caitlin, what is something that is joyful within your life right now? Well, I think it won't be a surprise that it's family. Um, you know, family isn't always easy, um, but it is defining in my life. It's it's why I write about family. But I shared a post on Facebook recently about a child at camp um, who has no opportunity to text, um, but sneaked one out um, asking for books. You know, and those those treasured moments when you can celebrate who a child is becoming, you know, a reader, a writer, a, you know, a hiker, a, a, a swimmer. And, you know, I just, I savor those moments, you know, I mm -hmm. savor those moments. And in addition to her text, some wonderful memories popped up through OneDrive today of my older child actually mowing the lawn with my husband, which will make you laugh because we were talking about mowing lawns <laughs> earlier. But I just, th those are the beautiful things in my life, those moments with family. And I save them in my mind. Mm -hmm. You know, I save them like little, like a mental scrapbook. Um, and sometimes I go through them just to savor them and treasure them again. Mm -hmm. Do you... Are you a picture taker? Do you write down memories or what does that look like for you to savor those? I do have pictures. I have a ton of pictures. The other thing I did because I'm a working mom is um, I tried when my children were little um, to email my mother things that they said because she was out of state and didn't get to see them. But by doing that, I actually created sort of a verbal scrapbook so when my kids said cute things or did funny things or i was recounting something sweet that they'd done to my mom yes i was sharing it with her but now i have this trove of emails and i've i've printed a lot of them out and we laugh over them now you know i've i've put them in the baby books they're still on the email but i do both mm -hmm. I really love that you put them through your email because you'll always have like a document and an account there. That's so smart. <laughs> well, it was, it wasn't something I thought of. It was just expedient. You know, I have, I have two kids very close in age and a business to run. And I mean, I remember the day a, a women's glossy called me and I picked up the phone and I you know, said, this is Caitlin, Caitlin Hamilton marketing. And my son was on my hip cooing, singing beautiful baby songs. And the other person on the line paused and I, and I said, this is a mommy owned business. My child is fine, but my child is right here. And I hope that you can hear, I apologize if there's excess noise. I don't remember everything I said. But there was this sort of pause and then the gentleman went on, you know, like, okay, I understand what I'm hearing in the background. And, you know, I typed that up 
and sent it off. And so it wasn't any smart plan I had. It was, it's, it was simply just what worked, but it turned out to be really effective. You know, now we can all read them and laugh. I really enjoy, I soaked in when you said, this is a mommy owned business. Like my heart just gave a warm hug to mm -hmm. that beautiful wordage of like just holding space for running a business and being a mom and just intertwining both beautiful things together and validating that. That was so beautiful. Thank you. I did actually use that phrase. And this was at a time when I don't think um, people necessarily worked from home as much. Um, but it seemed to me politely, politely assertive, you know, that I can do both. I am doing both. How can I help you today? My child is fine. You know, he's just singing a song to you <laughs> in Manhattan, you know? So yeah, I think I, I, I do like the phrase mommy owned business. And now there's so many more of us, right? And we have to, um, we have to remember that we're okay that way have to help each other out, stand up for each other. Mm -hmm. Can you share with our listeners and viewers of what Geographies of the Heart is all about? Yes. Um, geographies of the Heart is about a multi-generational family, but it's told from the perspective of, in the beginning, a 20-something year old woman named Sarah. And Sarah, um, because she sadly can't find a job, um, has taken on the role of caregiver for her elderly grandparents because she's the most available. Um, her sister, who is very career-minded, um, has had greater success um, in meeting her goals in life. And so as these two age, one is caregiver, one is not. And they clash trying to understand one another, um, to accept one another, and to manage the different ways they express love toward their family. Um, I often say that geographies of the heart is, it, it's about more than one person, but it really is Sarah coming to terms with herself and accepting herself and others. And I think that, I think family is our first geography of the heart. I think it's the first landscape, the first terrain we know that we claim as ours. And so, um, that's why I chose to title the book, Geographies of the Heart. Mm -hmm. This beautiful book was a labor of love for you. Yeah. <laughs> what was the process like in finding your story? So um, this book, I've lost count and Rick can only help, Rick is my <laughs> husband so far um, in the memory game, but we think it, it was roughly 27 to 28 years in the making. And it began with, what is now the second chapter, a story about Sarah. And I found that I kept writing about Sarah. And then in 2009 at my kitchen table, all of a sudden there was Al. And, um, and then finally, many, many, many years later, um, probably the last two or three years, I realized that Glennie, Sarah's sister, deserved a voice, that um, there were a lot of things being said about her and she deserved the respect and the dignity as a character to speak for herself. So it was a very long journey, very long. <laughs> what did you learn about yourself in that time frame as you're walking with each of your characters and sitting also with yourself while you're writing yeah. that? Yeah, I sort of grew up with Sarah in some ways. I have spent about half my life writing about her and I'll look at some scenes and think, oh, that hits a little close. You know, and I've, I've, I think what I've learned, and I think what Sarah learned, and I think what Glennie learns, and I think what Al learns, all of all of them tell the the story in the novel, um, is that we're best when we forgive. We're best when we articulate our hurts. Nobody needs to be a doormat. I think that a lot of Sarah's um, upset and grief is justifiable. She's managing a new child, a new business, caregiving all alone. She doesn't understand them from medical vocabulary. Her doctor sister would. I think a lot of it is understandable. It's just that she sinks into it. She holds on to that too long. And I think when she learns to forgive and they each learn to forgive, um, 
the, I think that's what the, the journey is really for all of us. And so that was my lesson, you know, don't hold on, let go. Life is, life is too short. In your story, you talk a lot about different things passed down from generation to generation. What are things that you loved about their family traditions that's different than your own? Well, my family um, does not have a women's quilt. And I really loved that each woman in the family, in the Macmillan family, added a square. Because when that um, blanket unfurls, and it does several times in the book, um, it comes with the history and the hope and the joy and the pain and the forgiveness of, you know, a century plus of women. Um, it's not a beautiful object either. It is a tattered, slightly stinky object, um, which I think is really realistic. So in terms of of what that family has, the Macmillans, as opposed to the Summies or the Hamiltons, it's that quilt. I really began to love that quilt. I really loved and enjoyed your three main characters, Sarah, Al, and Glenny, for completely different reasons. What did you personally enjoy about each one of them as you walked on the journey? Nobody's asked me that. And let me just say that it means so much to me that you cared for Glenny. I think she's the hardest to love. Um, I love, I'll start with Al. Um, I love Al's open heartedness. He greets the world despite his own pain, always, always from childhood on, um, looking for the best in people. Um, so I love that about Al. Um, I love how honest Sarah is. She's really tough on, on other people, but she's also really tough on herself. And I think in the book, she is not afraid to say, I'm sorry, man, I was really, I was really wrong. I caused a lot of pain. I'm sorry. And the thing I love about Glenny is she never takes credit. Um, Glenny did a lot of things, very giving, beautiful things. And nobody knew because she never announced it. And I just think in some ways, ironically enough, she's the most giving character in the book. Mm -hmm. Yes. I loved that about Gwenny too. <laughs> Maybe that's what redeems her for readers. Mm -hmm. It definitely did for me. I really enjoyed connecting and, and feeling that sense of her. Mm -hmm. She's she's a lonely person, um, but she's a good person. The misunderstood characters are some of my favorite, personally, of like because there's so much more depth than what people give the opportunity to see. But if you look a little bit closer, that's when the treasure really hits home. Yeah, and I think that's very much the case for Gin for Glenny. I, I didn't plan to put her stories uh, where they are necessarily. I didn't, um, I just knew she had to speak and I knew she had to be at a certain point in her medical career to be able to say some of the things she was going to say. So sort of by default, she came at the end. So I think what's interesting, and since I'm not a reader, it's hard for me to know, but I think you come with these really potentially set expectations of who Glenny is and her her chapters her stories her her voice comes sort of toward the end of the book and and i hope um that that not only do people discover the 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 breadth of who she is the the truth of of her her complexities but also that it makes everybody sort of pause and think in the way it made sarah pause and think you know we none of us is perfect so let's be a little bit more like Al and go out and greet people more openly, even those who've hurt us, because Al was hurt tremendously throughout his life. And he, you know, he never rejected people. You know, that's why Sarah calls him, you know, he's got the heart of a puppy and the body of a bear. Mm -hmm. He always had that puppy, that openness. And I think by the end, I hope everyone will have that willingness to look at people fresh, to look at people for the best in them. 
you know, to set the burdens down. What are your geographies of the heart, Kaylin? Oh, that's an interesting question. Nobody else has asked me either. Um, certainly family. I mean, absolutely family is my primary geography of my heart, but also place. There are a couple of places that have clearly imprinted on me. Um, probably the primary one being Minnesota. Um, it's not where I'm from originally. Um, but I always joke that the cold snapped me awake and seeped into me because I always write about Minnesota. I've, I've been in the <laughs> South for 11 years and I don't write about the South and the heat. I'm always writing about snow, family, family and, and place, I guess. Mm -hmm. Is there something about the snow that speaks to you differently than the heat? It, it does. And I, I guess I'm, I'm a real, I love snow. I love cold. Um, when I moved here, people asked me how I thought I'd do in the, in the South. And I've lived in every part of, <laughs> every part of the country now, but I said that I would be pressing my nose to the glass about six months out of the year waiting for snow. Um, <laughs> I, I don't, I don't know why I love it or, or why I love the cold, but I think as a writer that the cold, kind of works in this book um, in a way heat never would because I associate heat with temper and these women are they don't yell they're not they don't have tempers in that way they let things they sort of see the book mm -hmm. is sort of a simmering tension and and I talked once before about the fact that really this whole book is about hearts that froze and begin to thaw and so I think that the cold and the snow makes sense here. And I sort of love it anyway. I love the cold anyway. So I'm always happy to write about that dynamic. Mm -hmm. Not only are you an author, you also are a publicist and have a marketing team with your husband. Yes. What are a few things that you have loved about supporting yourself on your authoring journey but then what are a few things that you've also enjoyed about supporting other authors on their journey? Okay, well, let me start with, with myself. I need to give a shout out here to my husband, Rick, who is my publicist. Um, he works really, really hard for me. And it's not easy to be your partner's publicist. It's just not. Um, things I've enjoyed about this journey are speaking with you, you know, <laughs> getting to, to meet and to make and meet new friends. Um, although the pandemic has been a time when we really can't travel. Um, I still feel that I've actually connected with people. And so that's been a really wonderful journey. Um, and I guess also for me, I'm just, I'm proud I did it. I mean, these, both of my books took, 25 plus years and I'm I'm just glad I finished them and they found a publisher and that they're out there um, as for as for our clients I really have focused a lot in my career on up-and-coming voices on small press voices um, and in that way I kind of feel like I'm always in the trenches um, it's, it's not always easy to be new. It's not always easy to be with a second novel. It's certainly not easy to be with a small press and I think it's getting harder. Um, but what keeps me getting up in the morning and grabbing the decaf, because sadly now it's decaf, um, mm -hmm. is that I think people's voices matter and I think stories matter. And so I feel like it's kind of a mission here to amplify those small press authors, those new voices, to make sure that they get the best representation, the best chance to find their readers and their audience. Um, we're very committed to our people. Um, you may not know this, but you know we, we don't take everybody and we always ask to see the book first. Um, it's a rare occasion that we speak to an author before we read part of the book. Um, so when, when we align with someone and they want to work with us as well, it's a very personal process. It's a lot, you know, to, we stay with people six, seven months. So it's really a mission driven, um, heart filled 
we're not going to be daunted slaying dragons kind of publicity firm. Yes, I hope that you find a tagline for that. <laughs> <laughs> maybe I'll just maybe I'll just lift that. Am I allowed to lift that? <laughs> you totally can lift that. I'm gonna lift like, that. That was off the cuff, but it kind of worked. <laughs> yeah, it is a badass tagline. It was just off. It came from the heart, you know, but it was off the top of yes, my head. Caitlin. Woo! Woo! Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna steal that. <laughs> Oh, I love that. Yeah. Well, I'm in. I was already Yay. in before with Woo. you, but that just, you know. Come see us. Yes. Come see us. <laughs> that amplified everything. Uh, we have a comment from the beautiful Suzanne. Hi, oh, Suzanne. Hi, Suzanne. I'm trying to see the comment. Let me see here. Oh, well, we'll put back oh, up. Oh, thank Give you, Suzanne. Are wonderful to work with. We're going to turn it Thank to you. the inner child question segment. Are you ready, Caitlin? I'm ready. I'm ready. Okay. There we go. First question. Yes. What are some of your favorite childhood memories? Some of my favorite childhood memories revolve around my, my grandparents. I did grow up in a multi-generational house. This is not my family. I do need to say I don't have a sister, things like that. It is fiction. But um, my grandfather was a hoot. Um, one of my favorite memories is we'd be opening presents on Christmas morning. And my grandfather would open his and we would all take turns. Um, but as it went on, he'd add his bows and stick them on his head. <laughs> So, and, and then he'd just sit there. He wouldn't draw any attention to himself. And you just bust out laughing. There's grandpa, you know, with bows on his head. Um, I remember my grandmother sharing um, newspapers she had saved from D-Day. Um, I'll never forget reading those papers um, with her, with her. Uh, my brother dropping me off at college with my parents. Hugely favorite memory. Um, walking with my dad in Paris, you know, just sitting and talking to my mom and holding her hand. Mm. What are some things that fill you with wonder? Oh, food, good food, <laughs> home cooked meals. Um, seeing, seeing somebody rise up and shine especially my kids, but not exclusively my kids. Uh, we have a lot of, you know, friends with kids and uh, it's a privilege to get to cheer them on. Um, we had a moment recently where one of our neighbors, um, a, a small boy discovered theater and uh, he has always loved to act and sing, um, but just the joy and the awe in his face filled me with wonder and joy and awe when he saw his first musical. Um, it's the small things, flowers, you know, I love flowers, birds, fill me with wonder and peace and joy and hope. Mm -hmm. I'm soaking in everything you're saying. Of, I I'm totally with you that I love seeing someone in their essence, whether it's on stage or like in a yeah. room with paint or with an instrument like that moment when it just clicks for them and it's like nothing else is happening around them they're just in that moment and you get to see that you get to see that or you get to see them overcome something mm -hmm. you know I remember the first time my son um when he was little fed fed the dog we were taking care of at the time and it was such a big deal for him to get the food out and put it down and feed the dog and he came back he was he was beaming you would think he'd hit a home run he'd fed the dog it fills me with joy you know it was a big deal for him to manage that at that age you know mm -hmm. third question what yes. is the oddest food combo that you liked and tried or you've just tried it would have to be, my daughter will pair odd things together. Um, and I'm not sure I'm going to get this right. Um, but I want, this is probably wrong and she'll correct me, but I want to say it was something like blueberries and peanut butter. 
And she does this all the time. She'll take, I, I think she might turn out to be a chef because she does this all the time. But yeah, I think it was blueberries and peanut butter. It was was it bad. like a spread? So she No, no, I think she before. was dipping them. And if it was, I'm pretty sure it was blueberries and peanut butter. Well, I mean, she wasn't using, I mean, you know, putting a knife or something. It was something like that. I don't have it exactly right, but I know it was her. I know it was a blueberry and something else. I'm pretty sure it was peanut butter and it worked, but it was a little weird. So not like a chocolate covered strawberry. It literally is like a blueberry covered. And she uh, put peanut hmm. butter on it. She puts some peanut yeah. butter on it. She does this all the time. And nine times out of 10, what she comes up with is, is good. <laughs> not always. It kind of makes me feel like a little bit like a peanut butter and jelly combo, right? Like you got that. Yeah, I mean, I guess so because it could be it could be sort of like a blackberry jam with peanut butter kind of thing. You're probably right. So maybe it isn't as inventive as it seemed to me, but I was sort of struck by the fact that she was putting it on her blueberries. No, that's very interesting. I'm actually trying to visually see. I'm going to try it. Well, you know, let me, flavors. let me, let me check with her because I, I might, I mentioned to you before we went live that the memory isn't always there, you know, 53, <laughs> um, at least I think I did. So I might be wrong about what it was. I'll have to ask her. Okay. I'm, I'm going to try that because that actually sounds really delicious and very interesting. Okay. <laughs> if it isn't delicious, all the summies apologize right now. <laughs> <laughs> Especially if my memory's wrong, I really, really apologize. Pre-warning you. <laughs> what? Pre-warning, just like letting you know this may not work. For this you, may not work. It yes, yes, it, it might. might it might be pre. Yeah, definitely pre-warning, and I, I will fact check. <laughs> Before we end today, Caitlin, what is some advice that you can give our listeners? and viewers on living a creatively abundant life? I guess I would say a couple of things. One is to trust yourself. There are a lot of editors out there and they're wonderful. My editor, Mark Estrin, was super. But there were a couple of times when I knew I couldn't go quite where he wanted the story to go. You have to trust your vision and yourself. And the other thing is to give yourself time. Of course, I believe in time because my I take a lot of time to write anything, but um, write your best book. You don't achieve anything by rushing. You don't achieve anything by rushing to publication either. Let things have the time, give them the respect of that time that they deserve. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. It was so much fun. <laughs> you have been such a treasure to chat with today and there's so Thank many you. nuggets that i pulled and i know many others will pull as well where can we find you if any of our listeners have questions about your book or anything that you talked about today you can find me either at caitlinhamiltonsummy.com or at caitlinhamiltonmarketing.com perfect and we will put those in the links below thank you again Caitlin. thank you here as you go about the rest of your week, remember to find the things that are working within your life. Look all around you. You are the one that's creating your story. What is your next step? Have a wonderful rest of your week. And Thank you. We'll see you next week. Thank you, Caitlin. Oh, it's wonderful. So much fun. Thank you. Bye-bye <laughs> for now. Mwah. Bye, Caitlin. Bye-bye. <laughs>